questions. My name is Molly Parson, and I am the Interim Executive Director of Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania, one of the co-hosts for this evening. CPPA is the statewide political voice for the environment. Since 2009, we've worked to elect environmentally responsible candidates to state and local offices, advocate for strong environmental policies, and hold our elected officials accountable to safeguard the health of our communities, the beauty of our state, and the strength of our economy. Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania works at every level to impact change across our state. From our field team who work across nine different counties in the state, organizing volunteers and activists to take action on behalf of our environment, to our political and lobbying staff who work to make endorsements statewide and to lobby the legislature in Harrisburg to ensure that we're fighting back against bills that would harm our environment and that we're passing proactive legislation that would help protect our air, land, and water to our new work, ensuring that President Biden's Build Back Better agenda becomes our new clean energy reality at the national level. This would be the most important step towards fighting climate change that we could make. And we're working really hard to ensure that that becomes reality. We're working all across the state to fight climate change and ensure that drinkable water and breathable air exist for all communities, regardless of where you live. We are particularly excited to be co-hosting this event tonight with our dear friends at Penn Future. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jackie, to tell you a little bit more about their work. Well, thanks, Molly. And uh, hello, everyone. It was, a, it was a dark and stormy night, as the saying goes. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope most of you are safe and home and dry and all those things that go with uh, uh, staying resilient um, in, a, in a world that increasingly tries to remain resilient uh, in the face of a climate emergency. Uh, I want to welcome everyone, particularly on, I want to welcome the Penn Future members that are joining us tonight, the members of the staff and the board, uh, and just to say that uh, I'm very proud to be president of the organization. We've been around for uh, 20 years. Penn Future was started with the proposition that at the time the environment in Pennsylvania needed a lawyer and needed a lobbyist. And that was the proposition under which the organization was born. And uh, I think that that's the, uh, and that's the work that we largely are known for today, though we, we do a lot of um, important research publications. Uh, we do a lot of community organizing uh, scattered around the state, uh, working on clean air, water, clean energy, and of course, a healthy climate. Uh, so we've got the, a presence around the state in the Lehigh Valley, we're in the Poconos, we're in Pittsburgh, we're in Philadelphia, we're in Erie, and we're across the street from the state capitol in Harrisburg. Uh, in 2016, Penn Future formed a strategic alliance with conservation voters of Pennsylvania. And uh, that relationship has been blossoming uh, since the time that that happened and allows us to collaborate um, on events like that, like, like, like this tonight. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna uh, quiet up and pass it back to Molly and uh, our guests this evening. Thank you, Jackie. I'd also like to take just one more moment to thank our additional wonderful co-sponsors. They include Penn Environment, Sierra Club Pennsylvania, Clean Water Action, and the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed. Now, before I introduce our guest speaker, just bear with me for one more moment. I would like to take a few moments and acknowledge some really, really exciting news that I'm not sure if everyone's heard yet. And just a few hours ago, the Pennsylvania Independent Regulatory Review Commission, which is a mouthful, uh, voted to approve the final version of the Wolf Administration's CO2 budget trading program, which will ensure the state's participation in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This is a major step forward towards cleaner air and more jobs for Pennsylvanians. And I know many of you on this call have been following the news about Reggie and uh, not just following the news, but actively working with organizations like ours and Penn Future to make this a reality. We want to thank Governor Wolf and the Department of Environmental Protection for shepherding this um, through to final approval. And we're really excited and looking forward to the implementation phase for Reggie as Pennsylvania finally joins the 11 other neighboring states that are reaping these benefits. 
So um, we can all have a celebratory um, drink or uh, <laughs> cheer tonight um, because that's a, a really big next step that we've achieved in this fight. Now, I am very pleased to introduce um, our guest speaker tonight, Pennsylvania's Attorney General, Josh Shapiro. And before I go into his intro, I will say that I know the Attorney General is um, currently in transit and um, dealing with this uh, inclement weather as we all are. And so uh, please grant him some patience uh, if we have some technological issues. But uh, first elected in 2017, Attorney General Shapiro is in his second term in office. He previously served as chairman of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners and as state representative for Pennsylvania's 153rd House District. As Attorney General, he has consistently fought for the rights of everyday Pennsylvanians and worked to hold powerful corporations and institutions accountable. Nowhere was this mandate to take on the powerful more evident than in the work that he has done to uphold our constitutional rights to clean air, land, and water. His office has worked hard to defend against the drastic environmental rollbacks we've seen from the legislature recently. And last year, he released a massive investigation revealing both the severe health and environmental impacts of fracking and the lack of oversight that's enabled the drilling industry to pollute our air, land, and water without impunity. We look forward to hearing more about this important work tonight. Uh, Attorney General Shapiro, if you are there and can hear me, uh, we thank you so much for joining. Not sure if they are able to hear me. Um, I believe we have some representation from the Attorney General staff, though. Bear with us a moment, folks. Hi, this is Rebecca Franz. Um, I am the Chief Deputy Attorney General in the Environmental Crime Section with the Office of Attorney General. And um, for the time being, I believe the Attorney General's connection is a little bit shaky, so um, I can start out the evening. So thanks for giving us the opportunity to, to come before you and, and chat this evening. Um, this certainly is an important issue, both to myself and to the members of the environmental crime section, as well as to the attorney general. Um, the work is incredibly important and we're, we're happy to partner with agencies and organizations like yours um, to do this important work. And as you know, we issued a report last summer, a grand jury report on fracking um, and the environmental impacts that come from that. Um, we're hoping that the very common sense uh, recommendations that were made by the grand jurors in that report ultimately um, come to fruition. And you know, I think one of those is the idea of getting original jurisdiction to our office because there are so many folks across the Commonwealth who have been impacted by the devastation that some of these companies can wreak when they are out drilling and fracking and, and doing their activity. And um, if we cannot hold them accountable within our office, oftentimes they seem to uh, escape any sort of penalties for the actions that they take. And then the landowners and the folks that are impacted um, go without any sort of recompense for what's happened to them. And unfortunately, we're in a position where we can only handle the cases that are given to us. And our jurisdiction is limited by the Commonwealth Attorneys Act, which says that we can take cases um, either from the Department of Environmental Protection or from local DA's offices. And um, sometimes that has been limited I think our, the grand jurors report shows some of the failings that the Department of Environmental Protection has had in this field over the course of you know, the last decade or so. And so I think the, the biggest motivation that we have to be able to continue to do the work that we do is 
to try to get original jurisdiction so that, you know, we have homeowners that come to us all the time and we're very limited in what we can tell them um, that how we can help them at this point. Uh, we direct them either to DEP or oftentimes to local district attorney's offices in the hopes that those DAs will ultimately uh, forward those cases to us. We've had a lot of success in that regard. Um, so we do have a lot of cases that we're working on and will continue to work on. But um, I think, you know, in terms of the, the ways that we can partner with all of your organizations is really um, in that manner, in terms of getting out the, the word to local legislators to say that this is important, um, that, that we be given original jurisdiction to be able to continue to do this work and to protect the Commonwealth and the, the, the constitutional right that exists in Pennsylvania for clean air and pure water, um, which unfortunately falls flat um, a lot of the time, far, far too often. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that introduction. We really appreciate it. Um, I don't know if we have a time check on the Attorney General, but um, if you have the capacity to answer some questions, I would love to start taking. We had an abundance of uh, wonderful questions submitted um, by guests that we have um, joining us tonight. And um, I hope you are not too offended if we also ask some of these questions of the Attorney General once he gets on, but we would love to hear from you as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, wonderful. Well, so uh, Richard, one of our attendees and others have brought up the Environmental Rights Amendment, Section 1, Article 27, um, which defends Pennsylvanians' rights to clean air and water. Uh, but over the years, the constitutional amendment um, hasn't had much legal bearing, and that's beginning to change, thankfully. But how can the Attorney General's office work to ensure that this amendment is abided by, protected, and fully enforced? Yeah, and I think that is, it, it's such an important and unique part of our Constitution that it really is incredibly important. And, you know, as I said before, and as you mentioned in the, the, the question that came in, Oftentimes it goes unanswered. And, you know, the, the way that we fight to ensure that that constitutional right is protected is by holding companies accountable and doing the work that we can do to um, protect the water and the air for citizens in Pennsylvania. And again, you know, I think from, from our perspective, the best way to do that really is to make sure that we can continue doing the work that we've been doing in prosecuting companies and holding them accountable when they fail to live up to that constitutional right. And so part of that is getting original jurisdiction for our agency to pursue any operators that do end up polluting water sources and the air that all of our citizens um, utilize every day. And I think from our perspective, that's really the, the most important um, way that we can make sure that that constitutional right is protected as we move forward. Thank you, yeah. As a follow, quick follow-up to that, um, Taiki wants to know, what other ways can we enhance environmental protection through the rule of law, including enforcing the Environmental Rights Amendment? Well, I think, um, you know, partnering with other organizations to, to do the work that you continue to do is incredibly important. Um, we certainly appreciate um, communication with folks from all of your agencies. I know that um, we've had witnesses or victims of ours that have reached out and, and gotten services or assistance from various um, organizations that are represented here tonight. And I think that type of partnership in this particular area of law is so important because these companies have unlimited resources, really, and they are not afraid to spend the money and the resources that they have 
to make sure that their points of view and um, their bottom line is protected. And so to the extent that government, um, our agency can partner with other nonprofits um, to make sure that those voices are also heard and are not drowned out by the money that comes from the, the operators um, is incredibly important. And I think, you know, one of the best steps that we can take to, to continue to protect the environment. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely recognize that for a long time, the environmental movement has been a bit of an underdog here with, um, you know, all of these pollu big polluters being so well resourced. And I think that's why it's particularly important, like you mentioned, to have, uh, you know, powerful actors like the Attorney General's office standing in our corner. Um, so I believe, I believe we may have the Attorney General able to hop on with us now. Um, so, uh, but one more question to just close out and thank you again so much, Rebecca. Um, related to this discussion, you mentioned original jurisdiction and you know, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so, and uh, a bunch of folks in the chat were wondering how can we help grant the attorney general's office original jurisdiction? Is there anything that the average citizen can do? Yeah, so the idea here is you know, when it comes to typical crimes, um, original jurisdiction allows somebody, if I were walking down the street and I saw somebody dumping drums of waste into the Susquehanna River, if I had original jurisdiction, I would call up one of our amazing agents and have them report to the scene and we would start an investigation automatically. And we can't do that. We have to wait until we get a referral. And so the only way to change that process and to allow us to do the, the former and not have to wait for that referral is really for the legislature to, to take action and to change the status of the Commonwealth Attorneys Act and ultimately acknowledge that in this particular field, because it is so unique and ultimately um, a very niche area of the law that most local DAs just don't have the experience, they don't have agents that can pursue those types of investigations. So what we really need is for the legislature to understand that there is a, a fundamental lack of resources within local district attorney's offices and sort of turn that spotlight onto our office and, and give us the opportunity to look at and investigate those cases immediately. And that really does, it requires calling your legislature and, and requesting that they pass the bill that is before them um, to give us original jurisdiction. It was one of the recommendations from the grand jury report that came out of the Pittsburgh grand jury. And it's one that um, we think is incredibly important. And so I think the way that everybody on here can really help in that regard is just to make phone calls and to send emails and to let them know that it is important. And, and this is an area of the law where um, it would be very beneficial to the Commonwealth if the Attorney General's office had original jurisdiction. That's so interesting and um, very wonky. I appreciate it. I am sure a lot of other folks uh, on this call do as well. Um, I, I know I saw the uh, Attorney General hop on and then I think we've lost service again, but we're trying to get him back right now. Um, so I will um, uh, just one more follow up again on this or original jurisdiction. Um, how what kind of role do um, can county district attorneys play? Um, in, in this process and in making sure that uh, not just at the statewide level, we're holding polluters and bad actors accountable, but that in all of our local communities um, that we're making sure folks are held to account. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, we, within the Attorney General's office, we have great relationships with most of the local county district attorneys. And oftentimes we will be a resource to them if they have cases or investigations that sort of start within their county boundaries, um, we are happy to provide them with additional information and resources so that we can, we can help them to further investigations that are of an environmental nature. 
I will tell you that the Delaware County District Attorney's Office actually does have their own environmental crime section within their District Attorney's Office. Um, and they've been a great partner to us. And, and likewise, you know, we've, we've provided resources to them on some of the cases that they've been investigating. And so, you know, they're, the, the crimes that they would prosecute within their county boundaries are the same crimes that, that our office would prosecute as well. And so oftentimes it's really, it comes down to um, who has the best resources to further those investigations and to go up against the, the big oil and gas companies um, and their, their teams of lawyers. And so typically that ends up, you know, buck stops with us. Um, but there are times where local DAs will take on those cases. And, you know, I ultimately, they always have to be the, the first stop in the process until we would get original jurisdiction. And so from my perspective, the, the best thing that all of these organizations can do in terms of the local DAs is just to continue to sound that drumbeat of these cases are important and you know it's when you don't have to request that they actually undertake the investigation but that they are aware and willing to refer cases to our office if they hear about uh, environmental crimes that are happening in their jurisdiction and then you know i think sometimes it's best to hear that message as many times as possible because you never know which uh, messenger is going to be the one that is ultimately successful. And so whether it's coming from me sitting down with a local DA or it's coming from, you know, somebody at Penn Future who's saying this is an important issue that we think either you should investigate this send to the, the AG's office. Um, either way, if the case makes it to our death, we're, we're happy however it managed to get there. I think that's such a great point that, you know, often folks don't know the power that the everyday citizen has um, and they don't have the access um, to uh, to report an environmental crime or even recognize that that is a thing designated under law that they can do something about. And so I think that's a really wonderful point. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we're all really feeling the effects of climate change right now as uh, we I look out my window and there's been raining all day and I know it's affecting the Attorney General's travel and internet connection. I think that we have him on the phone now and um, I'm going to try uh, and see Attorney General Shapiro, can you hear us? I can hear you and if you let me start my video, I'll be able to see you too. Wonderful. We are so excited you made it. Yeah, I think, I think you all have to let me start my video. There we go. Wonderful. Thank right. you so much, Attorney General Shapiro. We are glad you made it. And um, Rebecca was wonderful in answering a couple of questions for us. Um, and, but we would love for you to tell us, uh, tell us about your office and your work. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully, um, Becca, you know, put your video back on because I want folks to, to know just how, how grateful I am to you for your service as our Chief Deputy Attorney General for Environmental Protection. You know, this is a role that um, historically had not, not really been a focus in the Office of Attorney General, but it's been a real priority of mine. And under Becca's leadership, we've been able to do some really important work. And I just truly want to thank her. She's a terrific public servant and uh, has done a lot of great work. And Stay tuned. We've got a lot of other important work in the pipeline here. Uh, no, no pun intended. Um, that we will be uh, that will be rolling out shortly. But I truly want to thank you and and your voices for, you know, stopping some of the worst attacks on our planet by the previous administration. You all have stepped up in a really meaningful way, um, and obviously the partnership we've had with you. The partnership I've had with some of my fellow attorneys general across the country, the partnership I've had with like-minded lawmakers um, has allowed us to fight back against some of the efforts by the previous administration in Washington um, in order to defend our planet and protect our environment. Um, of course, we stood up and defended the clean power plan and protected our mercury and methane uh, emission standards and stopped the rollback of um, fuel standards. and 
in that case, really tried to stand on the side of bipartisan majorities that passed the law in Pennsylvania to put those uh, fuel standards in place uh, years ago. And of course, defending the Endangered Species Act. So that was the work that um, we spent a good bit of time doing with the previous administration in Washington. Thankfully, uh, this administration seems to care a lot more about following the law and protecting our planet. In addition to the work at the national level, we've been hyper-focused on Article 1, Section 27 of our state constitution, which guarantees all Pennsylvanians the right to clean air and pure water. Doesn't matter what zip code you're from or what region you're from, this is something that is enshrined in our state constitution. Though many of you know, um, this is not uh, traditionally been an area of our state constitution that's gotten a lot of attention uh, and that frankly has had a lot of teeth in it. And we have tried to uh, address that by really enforcing the law, uh, both the statutory uh, laws on the books as well as um, our constitutional provisions like Article 1, Section 27. And so we will continue to use that to both do our part to deal with the climate crisis across the globe, but also to do our part to hold bad actors accountable. Um, my understanding is Becca walked you through some of the work we did in our recent grand jury report to hold the fracking companies accountable and to provide a roadmap for making sure that um, our public health and our public safety is protected. Common sense things like requiring fracking companies to disclose the chemicals they use or not putting a well site next to a home where kids need to be able to safely go out and play. That grand jury report resulted in numerous bills being introduced by folks like Senator Sanicero and Senator Muth and, and others who have been real champions on these issues, and we appreciate their leadership. But it also, also resulted in criminal charges, really for the first time being filed against these fracking companies, holding them accountable. And in many cases, um, they've pled and accepted responsibility for their conduct. And I can tell you that we are not done enforcing Article 1, Section 27. We're not done with the criminal charges that were come, and we're not done protecting the good people of Pennsylvania, because I certainly will not rest while kids are getting nosebleeds going outside to play because of the conduct of a fracking company. I'm certainly not going to back down to these powerful companies uh, who are out there every day undermining um, our planet, undermining our public health, undermining our public safety. We're not afraid of these big fights. I've taken them on before, and I'm going to continue uh, to take them on again and in, in well into the future. I think what's also necessary right now is that you continue to lend your voices to helping bring about progress in this Commonwealth, to support um, the bills that have been put forth to codify the recommendations in that grand jury report, to ensure um, that, that Article 1, Section 27 isn't just a goal, but it, it is a reality. So we will continue to take on these big fights. We'll continue to stand up uh, and protect you. And I just want to thank you for your voices being an important part of this process. And again, I just want to apologize, uh, Molly and others. It was, uh, it was a long road getting home from Center City, Philadelphia. We've had tornado warnings. Um, when I got back here, uh, my family was in the basement uh, and we're dealing with some power and other issues. So hopefully this came through clearly and um, I'm happy to yield the floor for a couple minutes. If, if you have some questions, I'm gonna jump back with them and make sure they're okay. Attorney General, thank you again. It's always so great to sure, hear Jen. from you. And thanks for uh, always going the extra mile to spend time with us. Of course. Uh, we're gonna just uh, uh, just pass on a couple of questions that were submitted from uh, what, the almost 300 people that are with us tonight. Um, I don't think the seat is gonna get too hot, but uh, let's see what, um, what folks would like to ask. And, and thanks for touching on the Environmental Rights Amendment because that's always top of mind. But I think we've, uh, I think we've examined that a uh, lot more work to do and obviously a Absolutely. tremendous amount of opportunity to uh, really distinguish Pennsylvania um, as we build case law and really put that, uh, that, that amendment to work. Uh, so many folks, uh, including Yvonne, Mark, Sally, and many other people uh, with us tonight asked questions about pipelines, fracking, yeah. and drilling for gas and oil here in the state. Uh, so the question is, with a lack of oversight on these industries, which of course you're trying to do something about in systems, it's really hard to tell where citizens can turn for protection. 
Uh, what's your position on pipelines and fracking and what leverage do citizens have against the toxic and other impacts of fracking? Yeah, uh, I didn't hear who asked that question, but it, it, it's a good question. And so I'm, I'm glad you raised it. And it, it's essentially three things I think you're raising about, you know, pipelines, fracking, as well as, you know, kind of who's there to protect us. I think, Jackie, I think I got that uh, from your question. Look, one of the things that we highlighted in the grand jury report is that um, the, the regulators, in this case, the DEP, simply did not do their jobs when it came to protecting the good people of Pennsylvania. Look, any company, put, put aside a fracking company, pipeline company, any company is motivated to produce a profit for their shareholders, right? I mean, that is, that is what they do. And they work within the bounds of the law, if they're, if they're honest corporate citizens, and within the bounds of the regulatory environment. And it's the regulators, the government, that is supposed to keep them focused um, on and, and doing the right thing. In this case, uh, our regulators, the DEP, failed to do their job. And in some points, the Department of Health failed to do their jobs. And when they were confronted, the DEP, that is, with the facts, as Becca Franz and I laid out to them, um, instead of, I think, acknowledging the truth that they've let the people of Pennsylvania down, they sort of doubled down and you know, refused to accept responsibility. A lot more needs to be done when it comes to the regulators, when it comes to the people who are supposed to be protecting us. And so that is something that we've been very, very clear about, very vocal about um, in this grand jury report and in the weeks and months uh, that have followed. As it relates to fracking, I think our grand jury report provides a very clear roadmap of the kinds of changes that are necessary uh, to make. And as it relates to pipelines, I'm gonna respectfully just decline to answer that question now given some of the work that we have uh, going on. And I'll be happy to address that at some point um, in the very near future. Thank you. Uh, as a related follow-up, uh, I'm sure you're aware that the road application of wastewater from convention, conventional oil and gas wells is a pervasive practice uh, in Pennsylvania's oil patch, but it happens elsewhere too. Um, and our friend Dave Hess from the uh, Pennsylvania Environmental Digest would like to know uh, what steps you're gonna take to stop that. Jackie, I did not hear the beginning of that. I'm sorry, we're having a little bit of connection. The question I is- I heard Dave Hess and I missed everything. Dave Hess, right. That's probably all that you need to hear. Uh, so the question is regarding the road application of wastewater from conventional oil and gas wells. Uh, it's a practice that happens throughout Pennsylvania. And uh, we'd like to know, uh, Dave would like to know, uh, what steps you plan to take to stop this practice? Well, again, I mean, I think our grand jury report laid out some concrete steps that, that could be taken. I'm not the lawmaker here. I'm not the regulator here. I'd like to see much stricter laws in that area. I'd like to see more stringent regulatory requirements, but that's ultimately going to be left up to the legislature uh, and the Wolf administration to make those changes. We are the law enforcers. We enforce the laws on the books. We try and meet uh, the, the, you know, the, the Environmental Rights Amendment, Article 1, Section 27, as best as we can. But we are there to hold bad actors accountable, to recommend changes where we can, as we did in that grand jury report, as we will do with other work that is underway right now. But ultimately, it's going to be up to the legislature and the governor uh, to bring about changes in the regulatory and statutory environment. Thank you. Uh, so a little bit of a shift now. Uh, so here's the question. Black, brown, and indigenous communities historically face environmental injustices at a disproportionate rate. How does the Attorney General's office help prioritize defense against environmental ills on these marginalized communities across Pennsylvania? Yeah, look, I, I have seen... Um, let, let me back up. There's sort of this old um, political saying, I forget who said it, and I hate it, but they describe Pennsylvania as Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and I don't know, Mississippi or Alabama or whatever in the middle. 
And I absolutely hate that statement because what I think it does is it divides Pennsylvania in a way that is unhealthy when it comes to trying to make progress to solve problems. And in a way that frankly does not reflect the shared challenges and shared opportunities that we face as, as a commonwealth. And one of the areas I see that um, most pronounced is when it comes to environmental justice issues. I see it when I'm in North Philly, where I was just a few hours ago today, in black and brown communities that um, are struggling from an environmental perspective, from a public health perspective. And I also see it in rural communities where some of these fracking wells are um, emitting toxins, making our air, uh, you know, unsafe, making our drinking water unsafe, making it so kids can't go out and safely play in their backyard. These are shared challenges that we have to address. And while black and brown communities have struggled um, in, in, a, in a major way with environmental justice and public health issues, um, high asthma issues, high you know, public health challenges, um, rural communities have as well. And I think we have a shared challenge and we have this unique moment right now where we have to come together to address it. And so while I totally appreciate where the question was going with the negative impact on black and brown communities, and I agree with the foundation of the question, I think that we have an opportunity to bring rural communities and urban communities together around this idea of promoting environmental justice and shared you know, uh, public health uh, initiatives that are really going to be able to help our commonwealth move forward. Thank you. And as a resident of uh, the anthracite region, I, I very much appreciate that perspective. Uh, very much true related to the rural uh, parts of Pennsylvania and our smaller mid-sized towns and communities. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for a couple other questions. Uh, thanks again. Uh, so this next question is coming from uh, Margaret and Steve. Uh, who would, who are concerned about um, a, an environmental issue that plagues our residents, which is PFOS and P mm -hmm. PFOAS chemicals, sometimes called forget forever chemicals, uh, that are dangerously contaminating our, our water and land. Uh, do you have any update on the PFOS situation or anything to share in terms of uh, what the Attorney General's office is, uh, is, is working on related to that issue? I think PFAS is going to end up being um, an environmental issue that requires uh, the attention of policymakers and potentially prosecutors over the, the next century. I mean, literally, I think this is going to be with us for quite some time, and it's going to require a significant amount of time and money and attention uh, to remediate it and hold companies accountable and hold actors accountable who contributed PFAS and PFOAS uh, chemicals to, you know, in, in our communities. Um, just a few miles from where I sit right now at the Willow Grove Naval Air Station, uh, we have a particularly pronounced issue when it comes to this. And when we discovered PFAS was contaminating the water supply um, at Willow Grove Naval Air Station, we reached out to lawmakers and stakeholders to try and encourage them to take some action uh, that they could uniquely take in order to um, address this and make sure people's drinking water was safe to make sure that the development opportunities that some were seeking there could be done in, in a safe way. We've also tried to work closely with the EPA under the former administration to bring some additional resources here. Um, I met personally with the former EPA administrator that, that did not go very well, as you can imagine, given uh, who used to um, you know, lead that department. Now under a new EPA, I know they are um, more focused on, uh, on these issues. I can tell you that we have also been working to try and see what type of litigation opportunities there are to hold the companies accountable who brought these chemicals to our communities. Unfortunately, because so much of it was done through DOD, uh, and again, under the prior administration, it was very difficult to get answers from DOD. I, I worked actually closely with um, uh, Congresswoman Madeline Dean and others to try and compel DOD to provide some of this information to us, along with a third circuit court decision, which made it harder for us to get access to some of that information and to hold those companies accountable. Litigation is a challenge. It's not something that we've quit on. It's something we're continuing to look at uh, with some of our partners and some of the other states 
that uh, have similar situations. So I would say um, that is still, you know, work we are doing uh, and is still something that we take very, very seriously. And it's my hope that while we do that on a parallel track uh, with new leaders at the EPA uh, and with some of our state lawmakers, hopefully we can continue to get some resources in to do what remediation needs to be done to ensure that people have uh, safe drinking water. Great. And Attorney General, before you uh, joined us tonight, we yeah. were taking a little bit of a victory lap uh, or on the fact that uh, today the um, IRRC uh, voted uh, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative regulation uh, onto the next, approved its, uh, uh, it, it moving on to a next step. Uh, it's been a long 20 months. Uh, we're not quite at the finish line yet. I understand uh, the road to promulgation goes through the Attorney General's office, uh, but I was just wondering if you could reflect a little bit on uh, uh, not only the, uh, uh, the the des the journey that uh, that 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 important climate um, tool has made uh, these 20 months and what's going to be happening here over the course of uh, before we actually get to uh, a final prom promulgation where because we expect yeah. a lot more uh, a lot more challenge. Yeah, I think um, our office is going to have a role reviewing this for form and legality, as I think you you mentioned before. So I'm going to be. Um, you know, pretty limited in my comments in, in, in this uh, setting here. But obviously, I know this is an issue you all have, have worked very hard on. Um, I think you said that you, you broke up a little bit coming through there, Jackie, but it sounds like you said you took a little bit of a victory lap. So um, you, you certainly should do that, given how hard you all have worked on this. And um, obviously, we're going to need to all work together uh, to address these serious climate issues. And uh, my, my role as the Attorney General, we'll, we'll do our part in this process. Great. And I think the last question, we wanna be respectful of your time and, yeah. uh, and your family. Uh, so Harold, Marion, and actually all of us would like to know, uh, what is the most impactful thing the average Pennsylvanian can do to help uh, the environment here in the state and uh, and some of your aspirations? Look, I, I think just continue to put these issues on the front burner, um, continue to have dialogue like this, continuing to use, um, you know, your, your public advocacy, whether through the political process or the governmental process, to make sure that lawmakers, um, you know, of both parties understand how important these issues are and that these are issues that not only will you vote on, but that these are issues that you're going to want to hold elected officials at all levels accountable to. Um, when I think about, you know, the, the major threats that we face as a commonwealth and as a country, um, serious systemic challenges, um, I think of things like civil rights, I think of gun violence, and I think of climate change. Uh, these are issues that need to be addressed in a broad systematic way. I would note um, that these are also issues that young people are leading on, uh, who have demanded to be heard. They've marched in the streets righteously. Um, they've called on their elected leaders to act, and they're having an impact on this process. I would also argue your organization uh, is having an impact on this process. And so I think particularly on those three issues, uh, it's important that voices continue to be heard and that um, you're elevated going forward. And I, for one, I'm going to continue to be uh, a strong voice on each of those issues and many more uh, in my capacity as a, as a public servant here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And um, we, uh, we're going to wrap up. You're, you're free to hang on or... Right. Go on to your next uh, evening uh, evening Thank activity. You. Thank you, and I'm I'm sorry for all the logistical issues here. And uh, most importantly, I hope everybody, particularly if you're in southeastern PA right now, just stay safe. There's some scary weather out there. Be safe, uh, and um, I look forward to hopefully seeing all of you in person real soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney General. Well, everyone, we're going to wind up here tonight. Just a couple things to say. Uh, let me just come back to uh, the, the announcement related to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. 
and where that particular legislation is going to go. Uh, wasting no time, uh, uh, Daryl Metcalf, Representative Metcalf, tomorrow is uh, taking up the uh, regulation in the uh, in the environment uh, in his environment committee and is going to be moving to disapprove. Uh, we're going to see a lot of pushback from anti-environmental forces in the legislature. And um, our sense is that uh, between their time in session and the time that they are uh, allowed, if you will, to, um, to consider uh, 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 actions against or for this regulation, uh, they could potentially be taking up about 20 legislative days in the calendar, which could push us right to the brink of uh, the holiday break or shortly into the new year before we see the legislation published uh, in the Pennsylvania Bulletin for uh, as, as final prom promulgation. Uh, and as the Attorney General mentioned, uh, the regulation is going to also stop at that office uh, just to ensure the constitutionality of the regulation. So we've got a ways to go. Um, but the important thing is to um, thank all of you for the work that you've done to get uh, Reggie as far as it did. We're not quite done. Um, we're in for, uh, as I said, um, a defensive play uh, with the state legislature. Um, if anything gets through, we need to keep the governor uh, apprised of our support and make sure that we have um, his support on a veto for anything that's intended to roll back uh, roll back Reggie. And then, of course, um, unfortunately, there's the possibility that we'll see some litigation uh, against the regulation. Uh, but all that being said, uh, it's a good day, um, but we've got a little bit more work to do. Uh, I want to thank all the co-sponsors that have been that were with us tonight, uh, help me, helping make this happen. I know all of you came to us from different organizations. Uh, so thanks again for your participation there. I want to thank Molly Parson for co-hosting tonight. Uh, and then, you know, finally, I wanted to say, please um, keep up your advocacy and following the many organizations that participated tonight uh, for issues in need of your urgent attention. Uh, your advocacy is making a difference here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then lastly, it's probably not too early to remind everyone that Pennsylvania will hold elections on November 2nd. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, most of you are uh, already registered to vote. Uh, but if you're not, um, the last day to register will be October 18th. And please make sure that your eligible friends and family are registered uh, and make sure that when election day comes, uh, they vote or uh, take advantage of um, Pennsylvania's mail-in and absentee ballot uh, uh, opportunities. The last day to request a mail-in or absentee ballot is October 26th. So uh, with that, I'm going to say it's a wrap. Uh, have a good end of your summer. Uh, stay healthy, stay dry tonight, uh, and enjoy your evening. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us.